There's a pretty one, Ulysses. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am kicking off the first in a series of tags called the Alphabet Soup Book Tag. And this is the inaugural one for the letter A. A is for author. I will be doing one for possibly every letter, but just like Alphabet Soup, they're not necessarily going to come in order. Thanks, Britta, for that little twist. I love it. You know me, on a Friday night I sometimes get bored and none of the tags circulating or speaking to me so I just whip one up. This one I spend a little bit more time because I started to think of it as a longer term series. Don't worry, I'm not going to do one of these a week, but maybe a couple a month, maybe one a month. So this is a long term commitment and I think it's going to be fun. All right, number one. A is for author. A good book by an author whose first name or last name starts with the letter A. Okay, first names are too easy. Arthur, Archie, there's so many, right? Last name's a little more difficult. So I'm going to ask you to try to find a book that was good, that you liked, with the surname starting with A. And bonus points for that. Double bonus points if you can get the first and last name. Archie Andrews, didn't he write some best-selling manga back in the day? So I actually lucked out and found a, a good book that does, in fact, start with A on both names, and that is The Belt, a novel by Ahmed Abodaman. I have talked about this uh, quite a bit on my channel, but I'm going to talk about it again because none of you, I'm sure, have ever heard of it except maybe on my channel, and I'm hoping <laughs> to make it a bestseller. This is a novel from Saudi Arabia, written in French. Uh, Abu Damon is a journalist, a Saudi Arabian journalist who's been living and working in France for decades, and he wrote this autobiographical novel in French so that his daughter, who has lived her whole life in France could read it and translate it into the English by Nadia Benabid. I absolutely love this. I found it in a used bookstore in Tokyo. If you track it down, it is still in print, not necessarily easy to find, but if you care about the physicality of books, this is a gorgeous soft cover. So get it, get the edition from Saki Books. I'll put a link in the show notes. The paperback cover is really thick and shiny and the the paper is heavy and beautiful. It's just a gorgeous book. It's also a really good book. It's an autobiographical story, but the protagonist growing up in the boonies of Saudi Arabia, and you will be challenged about any kind of stereotype you have about what that might be like, including one unforgettable scene with a sassy teenage Saudi girl doing a very bad prank. It's really good. Number two, A is for, well, ah. The last book that you read with the article, the one-letter word, ah, or A, in the title. I think you know what I mean. It goes before nouns, ah, an, or the. So the last one that you read that had ah in the title. And for me, that was a Barbara Pym novel, one of the last ones that she's published before her death, A Few Green Leaves, which I read about a month ago, and quite liked it. I uh, didn't love it, but c quite liked it. It was like a coming home after the novel before that, which was such a departure, such a dispiriting departure from her usual fare, and this was a return to that, but it wasn't Barbara Pym at her strongest. Number three, A is for Angry, a book that pissed you off. Well, I've got a few, but I'll just tell you about one. Britta, this might be a chance for you to step out on the balcony and, uh, no, it's too hot. This might be a chance for you to go and, uh, you know, make a coffee or something. Is she gone? I absolutely hated this book, The Natural Way of Things by Charlotte Wood. I, this was a buddy read with Heidi of My Reading Life, and she, we both hated it, but I couldn't finish it. I read half, and I was so disgusted by the misogyny of this story, and that's a controversial statement to make, but I stand by it. <laughs> 
Very briefly, it's about a group of young women in Australia in some kind of dystopic future that's very hazily sketched out. It seems near to the present that have all been imprisoned because of some sexual scandal. Each of them had some kind of a sexual scandal, but then it's they're in a this boot camp, this this concentration camp with two doofus guards and one baton an electrified fence but one baton and two completely inept idiot guards and they submit to the abuse at that camp because they're portrayed as being so weak and stupid and worried about makeup it just made me so angry and we did do a joint review which I'll link to if you'd like to hear more ranting from me and some perhaps more articulate informed critique by Heidi because she did actually finish it but I just thought this was such a nasty mean-spirited disempowering tale that I want to find every copy and burn them but that would be disempowering in another way but (laughs) okay Britta you can come back (laughs) (sighs) number four A is for awesome a top read of recent years and I've left it deliberately vague of recent years, because we're all talking about, for example, this month, the mid-year freakout book tag is going around, and just a few months ago we were talking about our top read of 2018, so I would encourage you to choose one from recent years that you haven't talked about on your channel so recently. And I am going to tell you about one of my top reads from maybe 2017, I can't remember, Idaho, by Emily Ruskovich. This recently won some obscure literary prize, and I was, despite not having heard of the literary prize, I was delighted that it's still in circulation and still getting attention, because it deserves so much more. This is a novel, a debut novel, unbelievably, gorgeously written with a very strange story about a family in Idaho where there was a brutal tragedy, brutal violent tragedy that occurred, I'm not going to say any more, about what that tragedy was that tore apart the family, just destroyed that family. The father, in the present of the novel, has remarried happily, and most of this story is narrated, or much of it is narrated by his second wife, who's a lovely person, and narrating an unspeakable chapter of her husband's recent past, while he himself is suffering from dementia and uh, forgetting a lot of stuff. So it's just, it's so beautifully done. It's heartbreaking. It's gorgeous. I loved it so much. I can't wait for Emily Ruskovich's next novel. But if you haven't read Idaho, uh, read some reviews to see what, if you're worried about it being triggering. The heart of the, the incident is very violent. That's disturbing for some readers. It's not dwelled on, and you spend a lot of time wondering what it might be and finally getting to find out the the true story but it's about love and healing as much as it is about violence and uh, tragedy it's just and i mean that in the most literary and non-sentimental just pitch perfect way ah number five a is for ah and i don't mean surprise i just didn't really know how to describe uh, give a word for the Title. The subtitle is A Book Whose Title Includes At Least Three A's. Bonus for more than three. Anywhere in the title, three A's, minimum, more is more impressive. And I found one that has four, and that is this novel from Nigeria, Jagwa Nana by Cyprian Ekwensi. I first found out about this novel and this author from Books by Lanus, who talked about it. His novels were starting to come out on the literary scene in Nigeria at around the same time as his much more well-known in the West contemporary, Chinua Achebe. And it is set in Lagos uh, during the hedonistic era. I don't know what era that is. And Jagwa Nana is a brash, generous, no longer young woman. Okay. Six. A is for Annoying. A character that drove you up the effing wall. I have many, but I've chosen one from an Elizabeth Taylor novel, which was my second novel by her. 
but I hated this character so much and other things weren't working for me that just before Christmas I bailed on it. This is A View of the Harbor. And it is set in a seaside town and the characters in this small town, most of them were pretty interesting. There's all kinds of weird family dynamics and love affairs and adulterous affairs and whatnot. But the stranger comes to town. I think he's a retired sea captain or something like that. Seems like he's about 60, 65. Bertram. And he starts living in the hotel. And he's there indefinitely to paint. And he is such an old poop. And he, he just feels entitled to insinuate himself into the lives of all of the characters, especially the women. He's not a creep. But he's so pushy and nosy and needy and codependent he just i hated him so much i couldn't finish that book bertram get the fuck out of town bertram I could do. seven a is for ambivalent a book you're still not sure how you feel about i think this is a very interesting topic and i have chosen this gay novel that was published 2016, Garth Greenwell's What Belongs to You. I read it, I underlined a whole bunch of stuff, I connected with quite a bit of stuff, but by the end, I couldn't tell if I loved it or hated it, so I think I gave it four stars. But I don't. I really don't know. I might, maybe I hate this book. Maybe I love it. The protagonist is a gay man teaching English as a second language in Bulgaria. And he cruises for sex in a public washroom, and he meets Mitko, who's a hustler, a Bulgarian hustler, and they have a quote-unquote relationship, mostly fee-for-service is rendered, but he gets quite emotionally involved with him in a way that's really effed up, I would say, but quite stunningly described. It seemed such a small story... But what the story was, was compelling. Taking a step back, it's one of the most disgustingly overhyped novels in my lifetime. Like, the, the hype, it was just a full frontal barrage of tweets and reviews, and I didn't hear anybody say anything bad about this until Steve Donahue let loose once on his channel. But I don't think it's actually very good. But I don't know, because maybe it's really good. Like, I am so ambivalent about this. And now, the author, Garth Greenwell, and I don't want to be snarky. There's a, evidence of a large talent here. But he has now kind of been elevated to the prima donna of gay literature and pontificates on a lot of things and I'm just, the whole thing makes me feel like maybe the emperor has no clothes and I won't really know and part of the reason that I say this and I am getting a little snarky, I'm sorry this is 190 pages soaking wet and his only other publication is Mitko which is a smaller version of the same story, like Johnny One Note Anyone <sighs> But there was a few things that I can remember vividly, and I think he does explore gay male desire in a way that resonated, resounded in me when I was reading it. But I'm still not sure that it's much of a literary achievement. I will get back to you after I reread it. But ambivalence, yes. Capital A, ambivalence. A is for anticipation. A book, whether it's a new release or not that you're very much looking forward to reading. At the time that this tag video goes live, many of us have done the mid-year mid book freakout tag and have talked about new releases. We're looking forward to reading, so you don't have to talk about a new release, and I'm not going to, but I am very much looking forward to trying Helen DeWitt's The Last Samurai. I think I first heard about it, maybe I heard about it before, but I first heard stuff about it that piqued my interest on Steve Donahue's channel, and then shortly thereafter, Britta and Adam buddy read it, and Britta said, Sean, it's a wonderful novel, but I don't think you'll like it. But I, I still really want to try it. It's one of those novels that everybody loves who's read it, but nobody else has ever heard of type of thing. Helen DeWitt is American, but grew up in Latin America to diplomat parents, and now lives in Berlin. And... This story is about a mother with a 11-year-old son in search of his father. 
and he's a boy genius, I think, and can read 700 languages and is fascinated by Kurosawa's movies. And that's all I need to know. I know there's a lot of math in here and a lot of stuff that Britta thought, oh, Sean, I don't think you're going to like it, but I want to try. Number nine, A is for actually, a book you didn't expect to like, but did. And I wish I could have thought of another one be except for my most favorite novel of all time, but I, I couldn't think of one, so that's what I'm going to go with. But I won't spend too much time talking about it. And that is Madeleine Tien's 2016 novel, Do Not Say We Have Nothing. This is a novel about classical music composers and musicians in China, following the characters from around the time of the Chinese Revolution up to and past Tiananmen Square. I didn't think I wanted to read it because I didn't think I was very interested in classical music or modern Chinese history. And this novel just grabbed me and wouldn't let go and still hasn't let go. It's the most beautiful novel ever written, and I know that that's a contentious statement among some of you, but this was a, a thing of beauty and broke my heart into a million pieces, and I have no desire to ever put them back together again. <laughs> Do not say we have nothing. Number 10. A is for affected. A character, book, or writer you feel is pretentious. Oh my. So there's no other choice but the gay novel, Call Me By Your Name by Andre Achaman. Ach Sorry, I... I hate this book so much I can't even bring myself to check the pronunciation of his name. That's bad. Oh, there's another AA, but it certainly doesn't fit for a good book in my books. But there's an easy one for you people that loved it, because it's a very well-loved book. I found this book so unbearably pretentious. I couldn't stand the writing. I couldn't stand the love story between the young men. It was just so Proustian. Precious, and at the risk of repeating myself, I'm quoting from my Goodreads review, but at the risk of repeating myself, pretentious, I couldn't stand it. Ugh. Number 11. A is for, how's it going, A? Eh? A book you liked by a Canadian writer, or one you want to read. And I've read lots of Canadian writers, and here's one that I'm looking forward to trying, and this one is set in... Contemporary Newfoundland, contemporary, like, 19, early 1990s. I see that the author was raised in Alberta, Emma Hooper. Our Homesick Songs. I heard about this novel on Jenny's podcast, Reading Envy, and I see that the audiobook is on Scribd, and I picked up the novel. Newfoundland fiction is better than Canadian fiction at large, I think, and... This is set when the fisheries collapsed in Newfoundland in the early 1990s. And it's about a family caught up in all that. Emma Hooper is also famous, a little bit famous, for her earlier novel, Etta and Otto and Russell and James, which I believe is set at least partially in my home province of Saskatchewan. And the last prompt, 12. A is for anticlimactic, a book you thought fizzled out at the end. I am not somebody who cares so much about an ending. If the book is really good and I'm not so satisfied with the ending, I don't care so much. But this one I thought fizzled out at about the halfway mark, and I was very disappointed. And it's a modern classic of Australian fiction, Picnic at Hanging Rock by Joan Lindsay. And it's about a boarding school, finishing school, which was a thing that was more prevalent in Britain than it was in Australia. It's set in the late 19th century, I believe, early 20th century. And the girls at this school go out in their fine dresses for a picnic. It's the summer tradition at the school. And two of them, one of them, two of them disappear. And then it's the aftermath of that. It's, it just uh, destroys the school. Uh, the the headmistress has a nervous breakdown and the police are involved and blah, blah 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 but after the disappearance it was so boring and it dragged on for so long and I was completely unsatisfied with that one so that fizzled out for me I can't actually remember how it ended but I certainly remember that I didn't like it so I want to do a little spiel here but very little about book 
being tagged in these kind of videos. I think I would like to see, as a community, BookTube move beyond the childishness of needing to be tagged to do a tag video. I realize that the inherent in the word tag is that somebody says, you're it. But I love it when people do tag videos that they're not tagged in. And But yet I also worry when people don't tag anybody in their videos because so many people, myself included, are a little bit shy about doing a tag video they haven't been tagged in. And I want us all to break free of that. So I have a long list, but if you're not on it, that doesn't mean I don't love you, and I certainly want you to do the tag, all right? And I'm probably going to be tagging some of the same people in future iterations of the Alphabet Soup book tag. But even if you don't show up on the next list, I want you to do the tag, all right? And I will do your tags without permission, too. It's awesomely anarchic. Did you see what I did there? Madeline of Made With Books, Mel of Mel's Bookland Adventures, Britta Bowler, Jacqueline of Six Minutes For Me, Natalie of My Reading Days, Steve Donahue, Greg of Supposedly Fun, Dan of The Weird Book Book Club, Mark Nash, Juan of Just One Reader, Sarah of Hardcover Hearts, Jay Shea, Leo of A Little Book Life, Sonia of An Enthusiastic Reader, Lukash of Totally Pretentious, and you. All right, thanks for watching.